Hello there, my friends. I'm going to tell you a little bedtime story so you can fall asleep to the sound of my voice. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. I'm going to tell you a story about Dungeons and Dragons. So I was in Adventure League last week, and I was a PC, actually. Usually I'm a DM but this time I actually got to play. So my friend Victor was the DM and he did a Adventure League module. It was set in Icewind Dale. And it was called the Grand Estate. So if you don't want to hear spoilers for the Grand Estate, this would be a good time to drift off into sleep. But anyway, we are a party of seven. It was a drow ranger. His name was Goiter, <laughs> level one. There was a human rogue named Evwood, level four. There was a half-elf bard named Tally, level two. There was a tiefling necromancer, level four, named Rango, who liked to sell cheese. Everywhere he went, he tried to sell cheese. Oh, and Evwood collected everything. The DM had to call encumbrance after a while. And he picked up a bottle of wine, and he just kept putting more things into it. It was very strange. We also had a human monk, level 3, called Ikkyu. I-K-K-Y-U. And we also had a high elf rogue, level 1, named... Magic Molly, and I played my Astral Elf Bard, level 4, named Braggadocio. So my Astral Elf, from Spelljammer, I guess that's legal, it's part of the Forgotten Realms, so I could play it in this adventure in Icewind Dale. And this, an Astral Elf, if you don't know, they're very striking, in fact, their eyes when you look at their pupils, it looks like their eyes are shining, like there are two tiny stars inside of their eyes. I also carry a harp with me, and this harp speaks, and she plays me this beautiful music. My bard is not terribly intelligent, very charismatic, but not very intelligent. In fact, the harp is more intelligent than Braggadocio, and they often argue. The harp wishes it were larger than it actually is, and the harp claims credit for making all the music that Braggadocio makes. So, anyway, we are set in a tavern as most uh, D, D adventures seem to be so we were in a place in Icewind Dale called the Torch Tavern owned by it was in the town of Good Mead which makes sense tavern Good Mead and the tavern keeper's name was Jorgen and Jorgen had a mystery for us to solve I guess there was a neighboring town called East Haven, and there were his uh, brother owns the tavern in there called the Barrel, and his name's Borgen, so it's Jorgen and Borgen, two tavern keeper owners in adjacent towns. Anyway, Jorgen had us looking for two lost wine merchants. They were supposed to deliver a special shipment of wine for a wedding in East Haven. But they had gone missing, had not shown up. Four days they were gone missing, and we were supposed to go find them. So we went and set out to find a human, two humans, a mule and a horse-drawn wagon. And we decided not to leave right away, but to stay the night and accept the hospitality of Jorgen, the tavern keeper, as it was late and dark and cold outside. 
So what we did was, of course, my bard joined in with the local band, and we got into like a kind of a dueling uh, note competition. Uh, but I uh, graciously let him win. People were I rolled really high on my performance check, so people were throwing us coppers, and I mage handed the coppers, levitated them over, and put them in the uh, dueling uh, musicians basket because I kind of scoff at money. It's not really the reason that I go traveling on my adventures. I'm really looking for the next song. I'm waiting for my muse to speak to me. And one of my character traits uh, is that I sing songs about my lovers, but I can't seem to remember their name. So once, so I'm always looking for the next inspiration. So anyway, we um, we stayed the night, and I uh, cast a spell called um, Peaceful Rest, I think it is. But anyway, it's a trait of astral elves and bards. I think it's a bard trait actually, which allows uh, it's a song of rest. That's what it's called, and so. After the song of rest in the morning, everyone has uh, 1d6 of temporary hit points. So we started out on our journey in the morning. And we uh, had a ranger with us. So the ranger was looking at tracks and was able to figure out how to uh, follow a set of tracks the further away from the town that we got. The sky was getting dark, and it was predicted to snow, so we had to decide whether we were going to go quickly or medium pace or slowly, so as not to miss anything. So after much debate, we decided we wanted to go slow, or I'm sorry, uh, medium pace. And the luckily, the ranger had a trait that uh, he could not get lost, and he could track at normal speed with advantage because he had a mountains, some kind of familiarity with mountains. And it was just by happenstance that he had rolled his character that way. So we were lucky in that respect. And as it turns out, we were going to be lucky in many respects as this adventure went on. We found out later from the DM so not long into our journey, we, uh, I guess it was about midday, 11 a.m. maybe, we uh, found a, oh, and of course, the I forgot to mention, the uh, DM was keeping track of time. So that mechanic was known to us. So eventually we found uh, the tracks gone off the side of the, uh, the road, and they were there was a overturned cart down in the ravine about 50 feet down off the side of the road and the remnants of a horse that had kind of been picked clean with just his bones. So we went down and, and the strange um, Evwood, the strange human rogue, decided that it, he wanted to take the horse's skull and... Uh, put a stick through it and pretend he was a unicorn, wear it as a helmet. It was just one of his uh, abnormal traits. Oh, did I mention this was a seventh grader that was uh, <laughs> was <coughs> playing this, so it was kind of an all ages uh, table. But uh, so we found the uh, dead horse in the wagon, overturned, and I sorted uh, my character, uh, not that smart, but still decided it was he was going to look through uh, the effects that were remaining on the uh, cart, and he found a ledger um, from the wine merchants. And it was only then that we found out their names were uh, Emeth and Folin. And uh, we had forgotten to ask their names. 
in our haste the night before. So I also uh, took a wine label as well from one of the bottles of wine just in case we needed evidence to um, prove that we had found the overturned wagon. And Evwood took a broken bottle and, uh, well, he actually found one that was intact and uh, he had, um, it had some wine left in it and he took a, uh, some of the horse's blood and put it in the wine and as we went along he put various things into it and he corked it and he thought that if he let it sit long enough he would have this very special concoction rather disgusting actually but anyway we found two people's uh, tracks two human tracks and a mule were on track and so we uh, followed that further on and uh, we also, uh, my, uh, the person sitting next to me who was playing the half-elf bard named Tally. No, I'm sorry, it was the uh, half-elf rogue named Magic Molly. She had as a half-elf trait, um, Mage Hand. So we, uh, the snow started coming down. And uh, we were starting to make haste, and but but we took enough time out to use each of our mage hands in order to make snowballs, so that was uh, kind of fun. But after about two hours, about two in the afternoon, we found uh, a manor house, and uh, the DM described it as uh, the snow and the trees was starting to cling to the trees and there was an unnatural silence right so there's this unnatural silence uh, descended upon uh, the land we found the caravan tracks and uh, led up to these two big front doors actually and so that was pretty cool there were these giant doors to this estate that was sort of built into the mountainside And there was a light on on the second floor. So there were two columns as well. So as most uh, d and adventuring parties do when they're faced with a door, they hesitate. But not Braggadocio. He went right up to the door. The rogues were looking in the windows stealthily, looking for a way in, and Braggadocio just opened the door and said, Hello to the house. We're here. Is there anyone here? As Braggadocio wanted to get out of the cold. So, Evwood, the uh, crazy bottle of wine, skull bearing, unicorn wearing, he walked in and started making horsey noises. And I walked in strumming my harp. So, we were definitely not being stealthy when we went into this. Uh, grand estate it looked like there was a barricade that was made either to keep something out or keep something in and there was a dead body by it in a pile of slime and so the uh, DM said well of course Evwood picked up some of the slime wanted to taste it at which point we said yeah you're that's fine you're all you're dead but we were joking he was fine but he took some of the slime and put it in his bottle of wine. And then myself and uh, another rogue, we tried to use a crowbar to uh, tear apart the barricade to a point where we could pass through it. But both failing strength track checks. Finally, we had the uh, ranger who had given us the crowbar uh, help us. And we were all uh, able to uh, pry open the... Uh, the barricade, pieces of wood from the bar barricade. It was a little bit embarrassing. The rolls were so low, but it was kind of fun. And then we were talking about burning the, the wood, or the slime, rather. And uh, the DM said something like, the slime won't burn. And one of the young kids said, 
and I quoted this and wrote it down, everything is flammable if you get it hot enough. <laughs> I said that should be on a t-shirt. The other phrase that we used to that we used a lot that night too was um, one of the um, young ones said, "What's the worst thing that could happen?" <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's that's pretty good. So that became a catchphrase as well. So we entered a banquet hall uh, beyond, and there were uh, flies that were around a. Uh, uneaten, half-eaten banquet that was still on the table. There were marks of violence on the three guests that were at the, the um, table, that were hunched over the table. And I was afraid they were going to be undead and come to life, but they did not. Um, oh, so we s there was a closed door at the end of the hallway. And we searched the room. For whatever reason, nobody wanted to go through the closed door. So we searched the room, and we found a secret passage and it was only big enough to fit in sideways so we went down and in glowing pink uh, there was a magic sigil and the human rogue I'm sorry the half elf rogue decided that she was going to try to cross the sigil and was immediately smashed thrown back for five bludgeoning damage She's level one, so she was about to try again when we convinced her not to, and we started trying to figure out what the password was for the sigil, so we just calling out strange names and that sort of thing. Nothing seemed to work. And I said, it's pink. What could possibly go wrong? Pink is a friendly color, but we were unable to solve that puzzle, so we went back and opened the closed door, and there we were in a kitchen with um, some abandoned burnt stew on the um, cook fire that had burned itself out. And uh, there was a bottle, um, and I, it had some writing on it, which nobody could read. But uh, I said, is the language in Draconic? And the guy said, yeah, it is. Do you know Draconic? I said, yes, I do. In my backstory, we had a pet dragon at the uh, in the uh, ethereal plane where I lived, the astral plane, I should say. Um, so I learned how to speak dragon. So this was a bottle contained uh, the essence of ether, which seemed appropriate. So I definitely took that, and apparently it had a powerful um, effect that it would put people to sleep basically a knockout wine. So, of course, the rogue Evwood, who was wanting to put everything in their bottle of wine, took a little bit and put some in. And Evwood said something else that was funny. He said, we should be careful going forward. There may be traps. I have a feeling this is a trap house. And I gave the DM a look, and we both realized that this young lad had no idea what a trap house was, and that was probably a good thing. But it was odd to hear that phrase. So we opened the, uh, the there was a door beyond the kitchen, and we opened the door to the, from the kitchen. There were four doors, three on the left-hand wall and one on the right-hand wall, and then there was a bend to the right. And instead of opening them one at a time, we decided... <laughs> Four of us would stand at each one and open them all at once, which probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, but it turned out that there was no ill effect. The first one had four chests, and we opened each one, and there were some that were locked, but they were not a match for the rogues and their thieves' tools, lock picks. It was basically there was storage, uh, just cloths and tablecloths and that sort of thing. The second one had uh, casks of wine and fresh water. The third, casks of hard liquor. The fourth, tables, chairs, furniture, that sort of thing. And uh, one of the chests did have uh, potions of healing. The other one had fine clothes. 
The other one had kitchenware, and the other one had just basic little trinkets. So we turned down the hallway, and along the hallway there were portraits. And I said, is there a name on the portraits? And he said, yeah, you actually, the DM said, they're of a, uh, well, they're all of one person at various stages of life. They're all have the name Carlton Carlisle. So we had a little bit of fun with that. So we decided that we we're gonna comically peek around the corner. Um, like one person really low, the next person's head just above them, the next one above that. And so a stack of seven heads comically peeking around the corner as if we were in a Marx Brothers or a old-timey uh, comedy. So we opened the door to a room at the end of the hall. And we were told it smelled like old manure and hay, and there were three unwashed humans in prison cells. Volan was in one of the cells, but his buddy Emmeth was not. And we asked... Uh, about, I have notes here, uh, one of the, uh, wine, the, the wine rogue kept saying, is it an ostrich? So what we decided was that Folin might have been a shapeshifter. Oh, his, we were asking about the mule, like where was the mule? And we decided that the mule was the one that committed the murders and, uh, or, uh, killed the horse and that it was actually a shapeshifter and it, was originally an ostrich. We were just being silly, I suppose. At any rate, the uh, Folan in the cell tells us that there are these cultists that would come out and take them back one by one, and they took Emmeth, and um, nobody would return, so they were worried about this. So, uh... <laughs> the rogue kept asking if the prisoners were thirsty, and he kept trying to feed them the wine that he had made, <laughs> but none of them wanted it. So um, anyway, after quite a while of debating on what our next steps were going to be, we decided that we were going to make a plan where I have an uh, invisibility spell. So I cast invisibility on Magic Molly, and she sat. There was We, we noticed that a head... There was another sigil uh, that was basically a force field that we could not cross. And so we decided we were going to try to figure out what the password to that was by making Magic Molly invisible. And she could sit there and basically um, wait until they said the, the word. And then he could uh, we could use the password. So when two cultists came out, Magic Molly stood in the corner, and when the cultist passed her and deactivated the sigil, they said Cassandra Carlisle. That was the password. So the two cultists come in, and we ambush them. I was the last to go. So between the other six, uh, they killed one and uh, incapacitated another one that was prone on the ground. So I just, instead of using any magic or anything, I just basically said, I'm going to draw my rapier, walk up to him, and finish him off. And I rolled so low that basically I just tried to stab <laughs> this helpless <laughs> cultist on the ground and missed with my rapier, just ching, off of the stone ground. And then we said, what's the worst thing that could happen? So what happened next was... We took the cultist's robes. Um, I actually um, was going to cast... Um, oh, I forget what the spell is, but basically I could look like another uh, person that I had seen, and I was going to be Fallen. But instead we used Fallen, and... Uh, because we thought he would be convincingly scary enough, or scared enough that we wouldn't need to pass a performance check. So we basically dressed up like the cultists 
and uh, took him in the room and walked in on a ceremony. And they were doing some crazy ceremony where they were going to sacrifice someone. And they were standing over, there were these uh, cultists, a few zombies, and they were all standing over a open casket with a very old looking kind of mummy in there. So the head priest, I suppose you would say, uh, who was leading the ceremony said, bring in the, the, the next sacrifice. And uh, Fallen was like, no, no, no. So I pretend that, I said, I want to pretend that I accidentally let him, accidentally let Fallen slip my grasp, even though I legitimately did. And so I drew a roll of performance check. I did well on that. I think I had plus seven or something like that on performance. And so the cult leader said, the high priest said, uh, you fool, get him now. And I said, so I took, I dropped my robe and I have this spear that I got from the previous adventure my character got in a adventure league uh, adventure from the Spelljammer universe. And it was, we were safeguarding flumps on, there was a pirate ship and the big baddie had this trident. So Wrath Mars, Wrath or something like that. And uh, so I had this trident, so I, or spear, it was actually a spear. So I throw this spear. Well, the spear does 4d8 lightning damage. There's a big lightning swath that follows the spear to its target. And anyone in that path, five feet off of the path either side, has to take, uh, has to make a dexterity saving throw or take 4d8 damage. And so I got three of the zombies and it hit the cult leader and uh, basically did him in instantaneously. And I said, nobody calls me a fool. The kids got a kick out of that. So we finish off the, the rest of the party finishes off the zombies and the other cultists. And we get to um, Lord Carlisle and he's the one that's in the in the coffin and he claims he has no knowledge of what was going on the wine was drugged at the banquet and they started performing this ritual and that's what he claims and then he basically uh, starts to succumb to his uh, wounds because he was being attacked as well and uh, as he does I try to cast healing word on him but to no avail he was, I suppose, already undead, and they were trying to revive him, so, so we tried Cassandra, the password, Cassandra Carlisle on the pink sigil, and that didn't work, so we had to go a long way back, and that was it, basically, and that was the adventure, so the summary was we made it up to the next town, East Gate, I think it was called, and, uh, we told the Borgen, the tavern keeper there, what happened. They gave us 60 gold pieces each, and that was it. So all in all, a pretty fun adventure. It was nice to play instead of being a DM this time. But I will tell you more stories like this about my DMing adventures and Adventure League, if you wish. You have to tell me, though, in the comments below. And I know you're drifting off to sleep, but in the morning, if you could wake up and smash like and subscribe to the channel, that would help me a lot. So have a great night, great sleep, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Take care. Sweet dreams.